thank you so much for for joining us today. We're so excited to talk to you. Um, this last episode was uh, was a doozy. It was so uh, so fun to watch. I uh, myself actually work in uh, a restaurant. I work in the food service industry, and so it was a very visceral episode for me. You know, how many times have I been like? stuck in the weeds and you're waiting for the whole restaurant to turn over. Um, I can't even imagine, you know, what it must have been like, you know, with cameras around and like with, you know, under competitive circumstances. So, you know, how much was a, of a whirlwind really was that experience for you? What was that like? Well, it's so it's a strange experience. And I, you know, I've been very critical of restaurant wars over the years and I still will be because I think it's not maybe it's not my favorite um, challenge, but mostly because I do this for a living. And I know that you know, in, in the real life, yeah, we get in the weeds, but we also, um, we have a lot more ability to affect positive change. You know, if the product shows up wrong and it's not the thing that you wanted to use, you send it back and the purveyor sends you something else. You know, there's a lot of things that you can adjust that you can't in restaurant wars. Um, what I will say is that for the cameras, first of all, you don't acknowledge them at all. It happens so fast and it's so intense that, that they just disappear into the background. The, the toughest part about restaurant wars more than anything is that I think they flip a coin, I literally don't know, to decide which restaurant the judges go to first. And if you're the second restaurant, more often than not, you're the losing restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's your first night of business. There is no way you won't be backed up and in kind of a mess when the judges show up. And so we lost that, that flip of the coin, I guess you'd say, and we were. I mean, our first um, seating went a lot smoother than our second seating did. Unfortunately, we just couldn't get people up. Like it was a, it was a longer meal experience than we would have expected. And they were having a good time. And I think that's, you know, that's a testament that I wish had shown up in the show is that they didn't get up, not because they hadn't been fed, but because they were enjoying themselves. And so as someone who works in a restaurant, you know, you don't just go to the table and go, Hey, be <laughs> like you, uh, you let them sit. And so we were just a victim of circumstances in that. Totally. Yeah. That's interesting. I know it was sort of that thing of like, you know, that balance I'm sure is difficult trying to figure out, all right, we, we kind of need to get these people out of here just on basis of like what this challenge is, but they're here because they're like having a good time and we're serving them a bunch of food. It's interesting. You know, I think maybe, maybe the thing that uh, I was, uh, I was most surprised by, and maybe in retrospect, I shouldn't have been, but I'm curious your perspective. If you had picked first, would yeah. you have picked Brian Malarkey to be your first team member because Gregory did. And I think it was sort of like, huh? But it sort of made sense by the end of the episode. Would he have been your first pick if you had gotten to pick first? No, Voltaggio was still my first pick either way. You know, he and I are actually really close friends in real life. And I felt, I still stand by the fact that he is a beast. He is a workhorse. He can produce more work than almost anybody I've ever seen. And I knew we had a lot of work ahead of us. And so I was definitely picking him first either way. Um, Interestingly enough, if I had had the opportunity, um, I still would have chosen Karen for the role that she was in. I mean, she has two extremely successful restaurants and she sort of does float between chef in front of the house. So I had, I, I think she got, honestly, I know I got kicked off. I think Karen got the worst. Um, she did a much better job in real life than the show uh, dictated people to see. She actually was was really good. I, I think like the team that I picked, I stand by was an excellent choice. The only challenge, and I didn't think of this at the time, and I don't know that I would do anything different, was that I picked a lot of chiefs and not a lot of Indians. And so um, I instantly felt uncomfortable dictating to them what they had to make in a scenario where that, where that choice will get you sent home. Because, you know, not that I would do this, but I think that other people absolutely would dictate to someone who they didn't want to see in the competition anymore to do something that they knew um, put them in a compromised position. I would never ethically do that, but I would say that the strategy of the game is one that you probably would, you wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't be surprised to see if that happened. Yeah. Totally. Sure. I, I think what you said about uh, Brian Voltaggio is, is so on point. I think like we've seen throughout the season, he has these incredible skills. He has incredible technique in that machete challenge. That was, uh, I think the week before last week, he's like filleting tiny salmon fillets with an enormous machete. It was incredible to watch. Um, and I think, you, you know, you're, you're completely right. Figuring out a dynamic in the kitchen is so important to productivity, especially in this, like kind of pop-up kitchen, your expo line is like this crazy system. And, you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult to, uh, 
to figure out. One thing that um, Daniel and I definitely notice is that you have um, such a, a clear and a strong passion uh, for Southern cooking. Um, and it was so interesting to see you kind of express this in the cuisine. What do you feel like is not so commonly understood about Southern cooking and Southern cuisine? Well, there's a great deal. And actually what we were attempting to do with Country Captain was to, to open some, um, some doors about some of the things that are misunderstood. I don't think we were particularly successful. And in fact, I think I actually upset some people in trying to do it. Um, in the, where I'm from in, in Georgia, there, historically it has always been separated into two regions. One is called the Appalachian South and the other is called the Plantation South. And the word plantation, I've never thought it to be particularly offensive, but I think that's probably because it wouldn't be to me per se. Um, but it certainly rankled some people that I use that terminology. Now, I say that to say that one of the most misunderstood components of Southern cooking is the cuisine of that region. And it's, um, it tends to be very elaborate and very European looking. And that doesn't have to do with slavery, it has to do with the ports that were there. And so they had a lot more European influence and they were very, uh, very strong Francophile and Anglophile. And so a lot of times when people see that food, like the dish country captain, they would never associate it with Southern cooking. They wouldn't pick it out as a Southern dish at all. But the South has a food history that's much more complex than fried chicken and macaroni and cheese. You know, those are, those are relatively new inventions, frankly, uh, especially macaroni and cheese. Um, and they don't truly represent the, the sort of sub-regionality of, of Southern cooking. And I think that's the part that I always try to stress to people is that I am no expert in Southern food. I am an expert in the food, in the Southern food of Georgia and Western South Carolina. Like that is what I know, but the food in Virginia and the food in Louisiana and the food in Texas and the food in Mississippi, they're completely different. And I know very little about them as much as you know, any sort of cursory knowledge would lend you. Sure. Well, let's transition into the food that you do know, because I know that you are keeping very busy uh, every day at your restaurant and doing all this stuff. It seems like you guys have been very successful in pivoting to these crazy times that we're in. I mean, just, you know, I was on your Instagram earlier today, these new menus, just all this curbside stuff, delivery. What has that been like? Has it been, has it been rewarding? Has it been challenging? What has the process been like to sort of pivot to, uh, to be successful in this crazy world? Yeah, it's been both, you know, um, it was incredibly scary at first, you know, and, and it was guilt ridden more than anything. I felt incredibly bad about the fact that we had to furlough, you know, the vast majority of our staff. It, it really hurt my heart to have these, you know, a couple hundred people who count on me every day for their, their, their livelihood. And then we said, sorry, we can't, we can't do it anymore. Um, that was, that was difficult. And, but it was motivating because you knew what well, we have to fix something fast. So revival, which is frankly, if you want to, the easiest way to think about it is revival is the real life version of country captain. Okay. Um, it has an almost identical service style. It serves those sort of big family style meals, but the food is of the Appalachian South. So the other region of Georgia, um, we knew that we could transition that one to take out rather quickly because frankly we had been wanting to do it for some time now and we've been lazy about actually making it happen well this this made it where we had to so um we sort of pulled the trigger on that within hours of shutting down and making that decision and it has been incredibly fruitful and frankly we the, the joke is it might be the best thing that ever happened for that restaurant because our hope is that when it comes back um the dining room reopens we'll still have this you know thriving to-go business now, with some of my other restaurants, Gun Show, there is no takeaway version of Gun Show. It's just not possible. It's a restaurant that feeds on you being in that room. And so rather than throw our hands up in the air, we decided to tackle a project that has been um, it's kind of simmering on the back burner for me for a few years now. I, I have been motivated to try to find a way to help with the, um, how do I say this, the, the the Atlanta public school system has a tremendous amount of students that are on free lunch programs whose families struggle to feed them anytime they're not in school. And we've been attempting to sort of infiltrate the school system for a few years now and impact that in a positive way, but we've always been turned away. They've, they've not really wanted our help, frankly, and we didn't know how to go about doing it otherwise. Well, due to what has happened, um, I think people said, you know what, we have to take help where help exists. And so we positioned ourselves again and said, we would like to try 
to feed all of these kids who have been displaced. Um, and so we were able to um, talk to some, some wealthy individuals in Atlanta and get them to underwrite the project and then work with some community leaders in these underserved communities and created this project called Meals of Love where basically every day I utilize gun show and cold beer, which are very large kitchens with very large, very intense staffs, a lot of really great cooks. And, um, you know, rather than doing fancy fine dining, they come to work every day and they make meals that go to these children um, that need our help. And so it's been incredibly rewarding. We did, um, gosh, I think we did about 4,000 meals last week. Um, wow. we, we'll do about six or 7,000 this week and then, wow. you know, probably about 10,000 next week. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty significant. What, what kind of food are you making? Yeah, home cooking, you know, so, um, you know, meatloaf, mashed potatoes and green beans one day, um, roasted chicken with cornbread dressing and black eyed peas and collard greens. It, we're making stuff that, frankly, their moms or grandmas or, or whomever would make for them. We don't, we don't want, this isn't a time, in my opinion, to push the sort of the agenda of you, you, you have to eat grain bowls and you got to, yeah, avocados are good for you. Like, I just want these kids to get fit. We can address that other stuff a little bit further down the road. Right now is a time to make them feel comfortable, not to make them more scared than they already are. Who's a, who's a, a tougher judge? Is it Tom Colicchio or a, a fifth grader? <laughs> well, it's funny. Uh, they, they both have similar traits in that they <laughs> will tell you exactly what they're thinking. I whether bet. I bet. Um, you know, Tom is tough because you can't, you know, you can't bullshit Tom. He knows what he's talking about. Sure. So. Um, but simultaneously, unlike a fifth grader who you can, who you can, um, how do I say this? You can share your opinion and they might take that seriously. Tom has already decided. So like, just because, and this frequently happens with Tom and I, I really like him. I think we get along well, but we frequently have very differing opinions of things and there's no moving Tom off his opinion. So. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Totally. So it sounds, I mean, it sounds like you are saying incredibly busy and you're doing some really incredible work, which is, which is really cool to hear. Um, we've been talking to a lot of uh, top chef uh, chefs and it's been really fun to, to kind of hear what everybody has, uh, you know, been cooking for themselves during quarantine. So what's your kind of like, you get home from feeding 6,000 kids. What are you making for, uh, for you and your loved ones? You know, the joke uh, that my wife and I have is that I've eaten more encased meats in quarantine than I have probably in the last like 10 years of my life. Like I like hot dogs and stuff, sure. but I have eaten them like hot dogs, bratwurst, smoked sausage, like more times than I'm just, I don't understand why they just keep happening. And it's probably because like, it's really long days. And so I come home and that's ends up being what we do. Um, I have been, however, I, I bought, this is such like a, you know, one of those things that you can't blast on on social media because people will be like, so wait, you're out of work and you and so you decided to buy a bunch of Kobe beef when you're out of work? <laughs> yes, like I did. I bought a bunch of A5 Wagyu. And so I have, um, we've had a lot of meals that have involved uh, Wagyu steaks. I made, um, I've been kind of like, I've been depressed about not traveling because a lot of my life professionally is traveling all over the country for different events. And I can't go anywhere. And so I decided that instead I would buy um, products from producers in different states all over the country. And so I bought, um, I bought this beef, the Wagyu beef. It's the best like American Wagyu that's out there from a farm in Texas. I bought um, hatch chilies from um, the original hatch chili farm in New Mexico. So I made um, hatch chilerianos with Wagyu beef one night. Um, We've also done, you know, uh, we bought blueberries from like a small farm in Maine and made blueberry pancakes yesterday morning that were just out of this world. So we've kind of been traveling by food. And so I just keep buying these little things. And then basically two days a week, Saturday and Sunday, I get to cook at home. The rest of the time, it's just just hot dogs for me, baby. <laughs> hey, well, I, I like that balance, the yin and the yang. Yeah. Kind of, that kind yeah. of defines you as a person, Kevin, I think. You're all yeah. Like the yin and the yang that are encased meats and unencased meats. <laughs> like, well, like, I, you know, when people were like, I, people always assume that because I'm a chef, I have these like really highbrow tastes. And the truth is that like, I just like food in general. Like I like hot dogs from gas stations as much as I like very fancy food. Like they, gotta, they all have a place in this world in my mind. Well, I think that makes sense. If you, if you're, if you're stressing in the kitchen all day, making all this fancy stuff. I mean, I can imagine you'd want to get home and just like have a hot dog and some like, a bowl of cereal or something. Just yeah, like breakfast cereal. Like that is, 
Yeah, breakfast cereal makes the cut a lot. Um, oh, I have like the taste of favorite? like what's a seven-year-old. What's your favorite um, breakfast cereal? Well, okay, so historically it's Cinnamon Toast Crunch. That's always Classic. been my favorite. Classic. But I got turned on to this uh, cereal company called Magic Spoon. Yes, I um, literally was on their website the other day. Dude, it's so good. Like the blueberry Magic Spoon cereal is phenomenal. So like, and I don't mean like it's good for what it is. Like it's legitimately delicious. Um, And the only problem is that just like all cereal, you're like, this box is three ounces of cereal. Like, so, you know, like the portion size is like two, two little loops. And you're like, uh, I'm going to eat half the box. Yeah, so. nothing makes me feel worse about myself than a box of cereal. Because it's half gone in, a, in about five minutes. And then I just, I just hate myself the rest of the day. But that's good to know. I, I'm happy to hear that. Well, you know, Kevin, I have to say, it, 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 it's been great chatting with you. We loved watching on the show. And, and, and congratulations with all the stuff you're doing with the public school system. That's really impressive. And it, uh, yeah, it just shows uh, the kind of guy that you are. So congrats on that. And, uh, and best of luck moving forward, man. Thank you, guys. Yeah, make sure you uh, stay tuned to Last Chance Kitchen. It's uh, The story's not over yet. So. Done, done, uh, done. Uh, hey. <laughs> we'll be watching, Kevin. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, guys. I'll see you later. All right, bye. Bye. bye.